Okay, I think we can probably start. Okay, I think some of you might know me. Clearly, I'm not Professor Mutlu, I'm Gennady. So I will be replacing Honor today, and Vivek will be replacing Honor uh, on Wednesday because he's traveling right now for the conference, ICCD. Uh, what, what I'm planning to talk, what we are both of us planning to talk about is going to be uh, caching for multi-core systems. And of course, both of us are biased. We have publications in that area. So we will mostly talk about our own papers in the area. But I will have a short introduction before that. So the general topic is caching in multi-core systems and going to be a topic at least for two lectures. Um, for some of you that didn't take 740, um, I will make a very short overview of what are the issues in multi-core, what are specifically different there, and what kind of issues we need to face now. So first of all, uh, those are very general uh, representation of a multi-core system. You have multiple cores, both on the left and the right. And the first thing you need to decide whether you want to make your, uh, say, last level cache shared or not shared. And clearly, there are benefits and disadvantages of both approaches. So uh, the outline today is I will go through um, a brief introduction to the problem area. Then I, I will talk about utility-based partitioning. I think it's a, generally good for the, uh, it's a generally good mechanism for dealing with any type of shared resources, not only caches. So I think it's worth talking briefly about it. Then we'll talk about cache compression, something I recently did. And I'll, t uh, I'll introduce to several prior work in that area and my own work on base delta immediate compression. And then we switch into main memory compression. That's going to be like our second half of the lecture today. And we'll see how it goes. So that's the outline. Any questions so far? OK. So reviews from 447 or 4740. So it's a question to you. What are the advantages of having shared caches? So I mean, don't hesitate. I mean, you all know, what, what's the benefit? Why we won't even care about, why we don't make all the caches private, all levels? Oh, yes, it's possible that uh, the different cores could be accessing similar data. So like a lot, for example, yes. So uh, different applications, different cores and applications running on them can have very different requirements for the cache. It, 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 it's, it's worth uh, yeah, sharing, then you can do it a more, a more wisely <coughs> technique. Uh, so, any, the same thing. Any other issues about, if you think about general things that you do with caches, what are the things that might be easy if you do sharing? Space. What? Space. Yeah, yeah, but that's kind of the same type of argument. You want to be wise on how you split the resources, yes. How about coherence? Think about coherence. Coherence is also easy if you have a shared thing. Like whenever you have something centralized, coherence becomes easier as well. So let's see what Honor has them. Yeah, coherence, uh, dynamic partitioning, and shared data and logs do not pinpoint. That's the last one. I would say it depends on uh, how you organize things. It's not necessarily happens, but it might happen. You can just have two competing applications pinpointing each other from the, say, last level shared cache. How about disadvantages? OK, let's say we decided to build a shared cache. What, what are the difficulties we will face if we go into shared cache? Come on, it's just that you're supposed to know. <laughs> so you could evict things that other stores are using. Yeah, and the competition, yes, for the data. Other disadvantages? So clearly, replacement policies might be now more difficult, right? It's a sharing now. Before, it was all like mapped to that single core. Now you need to, to solve this thing. So, so essentially, th those are the two things that you need to think about when you're having a shared cache, right? So you will uh, have some potential benefit that you can get. But in order to get that benefit, you need to be wise on how you deal with your resources. So the, it creates you an opportunity, but if you do it wrong, you can actually lose in performance, really. So um, the key problems there, again, uh, I think Honor have one paper where he actually showed that uh, great effect of if one application is very unfriendly 
for the cache and for the memory and uh, trying to grab a lot of resources, what will happen is that another application will be super penalized. And the weighted speed up, which is a key metric in evaluating the performance for multi-core system, can be actually degraded with shared cache, even though it seems like, oh, there are clearly a benefit of that. So it's an opportunity, but it's not necessarily a direct benefit. So let me show why that happens. So again, let's say we have one application that it occupies the whole of L1, but it also have a big portion of L2 that it can use, right? And we have another one, and you can see they both want a big chunk. Say the blue one is more aggressive, so what you will have, you, you might uh, have right now unfairness, right? One, say, blue application, uh, application running on the core one will grab bigger part of the cache. So it will improve its performance, but the orange one won't because it's not getting. And they can, and in the worst case, that will, they can, if they are issuing requests at about the same rate, they can start ping-ponging at their cache lines back and forth. So that's what might happen. So there were several proposals on how to deal with the problem of fairness. Because remember, before problem of fairness exists, but it was not a big deal. Because you are the only core, you do whatever you want with your cache. Yes, you can have multiple applications, but they are probably running like either in multi-threaded regime, so you don't have such big of competition for the cache. Now it's a big issue, especially if you think about hundreds of cores sharing one last level cache. So, uh, Several works were proposed. One of them I will talk today is utility-based cache partitioning. So all of them are trying to say one issue, how to be fair in, in dealing with the resources. So you not, you'd care not only on the average performance, like weighted speed up, you also care about fairness now. So how utility-based shared partitioning works. Uh, how many of you already read the paper before? So uh, one, two, three, yeah, four, okay. So some of you are aware, so especially those who took 740. Um, I will just briefly summarize you what the paper is doing. I'm not gonna dive into all the details there. Oh, Hong, you're so late. <laughs> okay, so the goal is maximize system throughput and observation is someone that already had that, that applications are not equal in terms of their demand. They might require different uh, uh, they might want to have a different uh, number of cache lines in the last level cache. So idea is simple. Let's try to give application that benefit from the cache more, more, more ways. So essentially it's like partitioning of the cache. But the thing about this is how to do it dynamically. So the idea is, as I said, allocate more cache space to that application and uh, the high level idea can be applied to any shared resource. So if you think about memory and the bandwidth, it's all applicable there as well. You can share uh, the amount of bandwidth you get by specific application or specific cores. You can do the same for memory. You can do like partitioning in memory. So it's all possible for other, but there will be different trade-offs there. Okay, the, the original proposal is micro 2006 paper. So first of all, the definition. So the definition is simple. You uh, want to see how your application behaves depend on how many ways of the cache you, you gave to it. Let's say you have, I don't know, two megabyte cache, 32 ways. So what you do, you take your application and see what will happen if it's running alone given, let's say, 16 ways, right? And then you see what will happen if I give it just two ways. So the difference, uh, that's the improvement uh, of uh, having more cache shows you that's essentially the utility there. So the bigger this utility, it means that the more improvement you get, uh, yes, so the number of misses supposed to decrease, so it's vice versa. So you can define it as the number of misses, you, you can define it as the performance, it's the same thing. So essentially, the more ways you have, the, uh, you expect to have less misses. So because you're getting a bigger chunk of a cache. So one application, uh, just join us. So here's one example. There's 16 way in one megabyte L2 cache. And there is an application as an Apple. So what's done in that experiment, you just give it more and more ways until you actually give it the whole cache. And just see that the misses just uh, drops a little bit here, but the rest is just plain. It means 
this application doesn't benefit from more cache. Then we took another application, Tvrolf, those both from Spec2000 test suite. And you see the more you give to it, the more it benefits. So clearly you want to give this guy as much as you can. And that's the saturating there, the overall utility. So um, the problem is if you just take a general least recently used policy, so what you might see is that you will give that, LRU just give this and that to those applications. Why it happens? Well, LRU just uh, looks at the recency of, of, of an access. It doesn't care about how much you really benefit from that additional space you got. So in that, in that sense, it's oblivious to the application. It doesn't care about how application benefits. It's very simple. So what happens for that case, uh, you will get, say, how many? Six, seven ways here, and let's say nine ways here. How that happened? Well, it just happened that uh, the number of requests coming from Tvolf is just a little bit bigger than from Upload. So it got a little bit more, but just a little bit, right? It just happens that way. What it might happen that Tvolf can have potentially even less requests, but you really want for those requests, you really want to have those additional cache lines. So it might end up very differently for LRU, but you can see if things are distributed equally, there is not much benefit that you're getting for, for both. But if you t find the optimal, if you gave, uh, here it was earthquake. So if you take that just two ways, and here you give the rest, that's the maximum benefit you can get out of your cache. So try to get the, so the idea is simple. Just try to find, the, approximate this optimal utility somehow. So what, what, what was going on there? There is a monitor that looks, uh, the monitor's performance of the cores, but, uh, the core and its uh, first level cache and data cache. And there is a partitioning algorithm that based on how much you benefit based on utility partition, it tries to give you more cash. So that's how mechanism works as hello. And you're trying to do this dynamically. So don't do this statically. Of course, there are a lot of interesting thing, uh, questions there. How would you approximate the ap application running alone, for instance? Because you don't know that, right? Whenever you're running, you already have a multi-core system. So you don't know the single core performance. So you need somehow approximate it based on, on the behavior of the multi-core system. So you can run like a small phases when you look to, there are multiple ways of doing it. But at high level it's simple, right? Just monitor how much benefit you're getting from uh, more cache and give it more cache for applications that have it. So uh, that's it at high level, but before we jump into a different topic, I want you to raise like questions what, if you introduce your mechanism like this, what kind of questions you will have immediately to that mechanism? So there will be questions clearly when it's described at high level. So why might this mechanism not, not be good sometimes? Or let's say I have a 16-way cache and I might have 100 cores. How would I split ways then? I would like halfway, what, what would I do, right? How, how to do partitioning in that case? So that's one of the immediate questions you can ask to a paper like this. Right now, the number of cores is smaller than the number of the ways of a typical L2 cache. But you see situations probably changing. It's harder to make the cache having more and more ways. It, it makes it very complex. But the number of cores, that's something we're getting right now. We have Tyler already having like hundreds of cores. So what would you do there? So would you, like you cannot even give, if you have that many cores, you can't even have a single way there. So then you need to group applications somehow and say like put a bin of applications, say 10 applications go to these two ways or something like this. So things becomes more complex. So clearly there are opportunities there. As far as I know, the problem is not solved in general case yet. So if you're interested, you can look at that problem. But um, at high level again, what uh, all this work about utility cache partitioning and trying to do that, they're saying like, have that cache. And that's like given. How I will use it wisely in terms of space. But another question you can ask, well, can I somehow have more cache without making it physically larger? And that's something I look recently. So question at high level is how to get a bigger cache capacity without really building a big cache. Because obviously, if you want more cache, you can just put like twice more cache on the chip. 
but it will cost you in terms of money, in terms of energy, and also in terms of efficiency, because twice bigger cache not necessarily improves performance significantly. So the question was how to get if, uh, the bigger cache for free or relatively for free. And one of the idea I came looking, um, I got when I started to look at the data of many applications, that data compression can help significantly. So now I'm switching into that topic. I will uh, present our recent publication, uh, Based Delta Immediate Compression, that was presented at uh, Parallel Architecture and Compilation Techniques Conference in September. We have collaborators from both CMU, and you probably know Vivek and Honor, <laughs> and there are people from Intel that are also involved. So uh, let me introduce the summary. So the summary of, of the talk is simple. I will, go, I will briefly go through the motivation, because motivation is clear. You want to have more cache space, uh, have cache with higher capacity. And uh, the problem is that if you just blindly and naively go and say, oh, I want just to have any compression that I have in software, in hardware, then the main problem will be, well, you need to decompress the data. And that's on the critical path. No matter what you do, you will pay that latency increase. So you want to have a compression scheme that will have lower decompression latency. And that's what in software was not typically an issue. So that's something you need to face. And our goal is to provide a compression scheme with this low decompression latency, but that sh uh, and it still should be simple enough and still high compression ratio. Everyone have this goal when they're trying to build their compression schemes, but all these goals are in trade-off. So whenever you want to have something with low cost, you might affect compression ratio. It might become too simple. So I'll show you multiple proposals that people did before and show how they tried to, uh, to trade one in favor of another one and where they were successful or unsuccessful. Uh, our key observation that makes our work possible is that many cache lines, cache lines have low dynamic range. Low dynamic range, it means that the values might be even big, but relatively to each other, the change between the values is small. So it means that the entropy is really not changing a lot. So you can uh, uh, reuse it and use it in your compression scheme. So the key idea is if you look to the data with those low dynamic range, it's very natural to represent them as base plus multiple differences. And that saves you a lot of space potentially in the cache space and in DRAM as well. So the solution is going to be base delta immediate compression that I'll show you later. And I will also show that it outperforms three state-of-the-art compression techniques. So now we're going into motivation. So as I said, there is significant redundancy in data. And here there is an example of such a redundancy. This is a four consecutive words taken from either a cache line or a memory footprint of one of the spec applications. You see there are tons of zeros there, right? And you might ask why that happens. Well, there can be multiple reasons why that happened. It can be a programmer written the code that way. They created a type, say four by type for integers, stored the small values there. So compi compiler just follows what the programmer did and allocates the space like this. And compiler might be not wrong. It might be the case that sometimes his values or her values are bigger. They, they require more than one byte or more than two bytes. But in general, it's not. So you might dynamically get that, get that and reuse that, even though in general you cannot do anything. Another reason that compiler can do uh, certain optimizations, all languages have different rules of how align things. So zeros might be just a part of the alignment. Our approach on uh, getting the benefit of these redundancies is using cache compression, as I said. And I want to show you why, why actually the decompression latency, as I said before, is the critical part of uh, any cache compression design. Let's say we have CPU and L1 cache uncompressed and last level cache L2 that is compressed. So whenever you have a request coming from L1 to L2 cache, your critical path is the path when you have a hit to L2 cache. That's, that's, a more, that's your most common part that you take. There can be two possibilities there. In L2 cache, you can get an uncompressed cache line. Then this cache line just immediately returns to L1 and L2. But you can get a compressed line, and then you need to decompress it. And that's unavoidable, no matter what kind of compression scheme you use. 
So it means there will be a latency there on the, hot, uh, on the critical path of your execution. That uh, general schemes allows us to formulate key requirements to any cache compression scheme. The first requirement, it should be fast. By this I mean it should have low decompression latency because it's on the critical path. Then it should be simple. Both compression and decompression now needs to be done in hardware. So it's not software anymore. So it means that it should be implementable and reason on chip and reasonable uh, amount of complex or maybe not that complex hardware. And then it should be effective. So the effect of the increase should justify all these changes that we are proposing. So it should be a visible increase in the cash, uh, last level cash size. So having all these goals in mind, we now go through every major uh, state-of-the-art compression technique and try to see what kind of benefits and disadvantages they have. The most well-known is zero-value compression. That's super simple, right? Uh, but, and it will have clearly two advantages. It will have low decompression latency. You don't need to decompress, essentially. You just need to store a bit somewhere telling that your cache line is zero, right? And that's it. You don't need anything. And there's also low complexity. There's no compression. There are no hardware needed to compress, decompress things. It's also very simple. You just duplicate those zeros. So it's simple, but there is one easy problem there. It doesn't provide such a good compression ratio. There are applications where there are a lot of zeros, but there are applications where the zeros are not that common, especially some of the floating point applications. So zeros are not that common there. There's no compression ratio, no benefit. So. You see, we, have, we got decompression latency, we got complexity, but there's no good compression ratio. The next attempt was something called frequent value compression. Let me describe you the idea. Uh, the idea is that the people observed that some values, when you run your application, ha uh, happens to, uh, to uh, be in the cache or in memory more often than others. It's like, again, zeros, ones, minus one, some other values, or some masks that you're using. Or if you're, uh, you're running multimedia applications, some, say, black pixels is very common, or the blue one. Um, then they say, like, OK, how we can get a benefit of that? And they said, well, let's take and try to encode the data based on those frequent values. So what they did, essentially, they collect, let's say somehow they collect those frequent values from the applications. Then they took, let's say, a cache line, let's say 64-byte cache line. Can you see it from here? So say 64-byte. Then they cut it into pieces, like 4-byte pieces, values, like 4 bytes. And then they do simple things. They just start to look and compare all these values with their common values. If the values are the common values, you can encode it with just few bits. So imagine having a very small cache that stores like eight or 16 frequent values. Uh, it means that if you have, let's say, uh, seven values, you just need three bits to represent them. So you just store three bits here, three bits here, instead of storing the whole cache line. So very simple idea. It turns out to be that it's very good in terms of compression ratio. I'll show the numbers later on while I do comparison. But there are some disadvantages to that idea. It was first proposed, I think, in 2000 uh, in micro. So any disadvantages you can immediately see for that compression scheme? Just think about, OK, you, you want to build something like this. What will be the first thing you will start to worry about? Idea seems nice, but there are some issues. Okay, everyone so sleepy. Any ideas? Just brainstorm. It's like I'm not giving you any grades here. So what, what is the problem if you encode things like this? What? It's going to be complex. It's not the first sort of concern, but it's going to be complex, yes. Uh, do you have a feeling why it's going to be complex? Oh, we have another idea. We're going to jump to complexity. It's yeah. going to take a long time to, to go forward to compress it because it's based on how often the values occur. So you have to know how often they occur before you can so I, I would separate your argument into two pieces. First, you need to know the frequent values somehow. So you, you need a method to do it. Typically, it's done through profiling. Either there was the first proposal was static, which is very inefficient practically. The another was it's dynamic. It has its own issues. But but the second argument there are like two arguments in what you said because you need to decompress things. 
uh, efficient. And the problem, if you encode things like this, some things are frequent, some things are infrequent in the same cache line. So it means you need to linearly go through a cache line to decompress it. That requires a latency that's going to be relative to the size of a cache line, which means that at least you need, I don't know, 8, 16 cycles to do the decompression. Imagine you're doing an L2 hit. It will be like, I don't know, 10 cycles. And out of a sudden, it becomes like 28 cycles and 26 cycles. It's unacceptable. So it works nicely if everything is nicely compressed, but you have something in the middle that was not compressed, then you need to do this linear process. This, that's the first order concern. The second order concern is how to do um, profiling. So if you do a static profiling, that's simple. You just say run for 100 million cycles, collect frequent values, and do encoding. But out of a sudden, your application might change the phase, get a new type of data, if you say Google, or you just started to run a different program on the same core, how would you switch? That's a problem. If you do it dynamically, you don't have that problem, but you will get another problem. Because now, you again have a phase switch. It means that you need somehow to invalidate the whole of your cache that's encoded with previous frequent values. So you see, there are issues there. Even though it turns out to be have a good compression ratio, it have a need for profiling, it have high decompression latency, and it have high complexity. And complexity is mostly due to profiling. So all these are the negative parts of it. So that, right now, we are around 2000, 2001. That's where it was proposed. After that, people look into the problem and try to fix the issues that were there. And there was a new set of techniques proposed that I would call frequent pattern uh, compression. So the idea behind those is let's not encode things based on the frequent values, but instead use frequent patterns. What's the difference? Frequent patterns is something statically known. So a pattern is, say, I have a four byte, half of it is zero. The first half zeros, the second half zeros, half are ones. The whole consists of ones. So there are a lot of simple data patterns that are statically known. And what you do again, you take your cache line, cut it into four byte pieces, and just check whether they correspond to that frequent pattern or not, and then encode it. So similar, but there is, no re there is no need in profiling now, right? Because you have all this frequent patterns statically. Also quite flexible. What are the disadvantages? So sounds good. People proposed it for the first time in 2004 at ISCA, 2004, frequent pattern compression by Al Alam al -Din. And then there were a couple of extensions people were trying to improve, uh, improve upon this idea until the recent 2000, 2010, there was a paper, CPAC, improvement over that. And in PAC 2012, well, there was another improvement. So people still try to fix issues there. So there are issues. What are the issues? Do you see anything? What still, there's still a problem there. Yes, one problem solved, but still something wrong? So the person from the last line, <laughs> help us, please. <laughs> I don't know your name, sir. Did you get the idea of frequent pattern compression? It wasn't clear. So instead of frequent values, you use simple statically known patterns, like half, zero, scale. That's a simple problem. Because you right. have to know what your frequent patterns are. So it's the profile that you have. There's no profiling issue here. I disagree with you. Because you don't, these frequent patterns are all statically defined. So for instance, at the beginning, like you just build hardware saying, I expect certain frequent patterns. Let's say four bytes are all zeros. Half of bits are one. Half of bits are uh, say, uh, zeros or sign extended. So you just build an array of frequent patterns, but you know it ahead of time and you can keep using it. So there is no profiling issue anymore. So that appears, the primary reason of this thing to appear is to solve uh, profiling issue. There's no profiling issue. There wouldn't be good compression because frequent patterns may be absent from many things. So uh, it turns out to be they are quite common. Again, I will show them. You will see they are quite common. So people didn't do this blindly. They look, those are quite common. Again, I show you there can be sign extension of the zeros and ones. There can be narrow values. There are a lot of zeros and ones by itself. So they are common. So that was not an issue. So they actually even improve upon frequent value compression. Any other issues you see? Think about decompression. 
It's still not the non-linear decompression. That's, that's a primary, primary concern with it. Still, if you encode it, if you think about, let's say that is my frequent pattern, that's a frequent pattern, but that's not. That's not that frequent, that frequent. Think about me now need to decompress it. For you in software, you don't care. You just linearly go there. But everything that is a linear scan is a very bad idea in hardware because it means that in order to find the offset of that element, for instance, I first need to decompress all these elements because I don't know each of them can be of different size. It's fundamentally linear. So you, you can try to build some pipelines, they try to find the workarounds, but it's fundamentally linear. Because it's, it's linear, it's not fully parallelizable, there will be significant decrease in latency. The best they, they did in the original paper was five cycles decompression latency. You may say, oh, it's not a lot, but if you think about uh, what, what is the typical latency increase in L2, it, it's significant, it's noticeable. That's why the next paper from this guy was how to make it an adaptive technique to deal with the cases when it doesn't work. So it is an issue. And another issue is complexity because applying all these hardwarely fixed compression schemes becomes also complex. There was a paper after that in 2010 that solved the uh, complexity issue. They show it wasn't the TVLS um, transactions of very large uh, systems where they actually show the whole hardware implementation, how to make it implementable in hardware still efficiently. But the decompression latency for that design becomes even eight cycles. So they traded complexity for even higher decompression latency. And the uh, final performance numbers becomes even worse than that of FPC, but the design is more practical. They actually build the systems with that compression. So you see there are still issue there. And uh, frequent pattern is right now, before our publication, was the state of the art on what you can do in terms of cache compression. And I think the primary reason that Intel IBM still didn't do that because it was too complex and decompression latency affects performance significantly. So time to go into our proposal. So I will hope I will convince you that all these things are fixable. Yes, it sounds a little bit like advertisement. But that's a conference talk, right? Okay. So what is the key idea? So again, we, just, we started to look to the real applications as before, and we've seen what are the key data patterns that happens to be in different applications. Well, there are zero values, as I said. There are something we call repeated values. It means that the values are the same. They might be not necessarily narrow as here. Then there are narrow values. What means narrow values? It means there are either extended with zeros or ones. Essentially, the beginning bits doesn't store any useful information. But the values here are actually different. So there is one byte of information in this case. And there are some other patterns that are still compressible that were not compressible with prior works, but we still can compress them with our scheme. Um, one of the examples is pointers to the same memory region. I think everyone who deals with pointers knows that they typically looks like the first bytes are the same because they point to the same memory region and then just the offset. So clearly here, that's one of the examples like this, you have just a linear shift in, in the offset, in the delta, but there is no base change. There was the questions before how common all these patterns are. So we did an experiment, very simple experiments. We take an L2 cache, a lot of different applications, packs, databases, web, web workloads, and we make a snapshot-based approach. We periodically stop the execution, take a snapshot of the whole cache, and look how many cache lines actually uh, can be represented with all these different patterns. So what we found is that there are applications that have a lot of zeros there, ones that are not, but there are clearly a lot of opportunities there. There are a lot of different patterns that you can have. So 43% on average. Then we revised of what we have and we make one general conclusion. All these data patterns have one common property that I could, would call low dynamic range because the difference between the values are smaller than, significantly smaller than the values themselves. So that means we can do something about it. And something we want to do about them, we called it base plus delta encoding. So let's say we're given a 32-byte uncompressed cache line, as in the previous slide. And we want to do base plus delta compression. What, what's going on? So we first figure out a base. In this case, the base can be just a first element. 
And then for every element, we compute the difference between the base and that element. Clearly for the first one it's going to be zero, but for others it's going to be something different. And as you can see, all of them, all these deltas fits into one byte. So now instead of 32 bytes, you need just 12 bytes. So you're effectively saving 20 bytes of space. The bigger your cache line is going to be, the more you save in relative ratio. Now, if you think about this mechanism and whatever properties it will have, the first thing you might notice is, well, if I compress things like this, it's very easy to decompress things because you can just do a simple vector addition of this base with that delta and I get my value back. So it's very simple. At the same time, hardware, in terms of hardware, you don't need anything sophisticated. You need additions, subtractions, and comparison. Nothing special, all vectoral operations that already exist in hardware. Uh, we also want to show that uh, it, it's going to be effective. I kind of gave an intuition in the previous slide, but if we do a more accurate experiments, you will, we will find that the average you can get with some reasonable design that I talk about later will give you 1.4 in compression ratio. But as you can see, there are a group of applications that doesn't benefit. So when I was doing this research, I would say, OK, why, why, there, why this application sucks? Why it doesn't work for them? And we look into them and say, hmm, let's take one example. So I take one of their bad applications, MCF, and they look into the cache lines there. And what I found, well, there is still a lot of potential for compressibility there, but it just turns out to be data of different types is mixed in the same cache line. So very simple idea. Let's use more bases now. Let's try somehow dynamically figure out which data corresponds to which base and compress them separately. It seems like a nice idea from the beginning, but there is a uh, natural question. How would I find those multiple bases? Who will give me those bases? It's unknown. Uh, finding an optimal base is really time consuming. We looked into how many bases needed first, and we found that the optimal is about, um, like I would say two bases clearly here, right? What this experiment is doing, I'm trying more and more bases to compress cache lines. And there is an interesting trade-off there. The more bases you have, your metadata in terms of bases becomes bigger. So you can compress more cache lines, but every compression now have a higher overhead. So there is a sweet spot somewhere. And for our application, the sweet spot was at about two bases, between two and three, really. So clear win, let's pick two bases. But still, two bases, I need to how, somehow find those bases. So we make two observations on how to find those two bases. The first one is the first base can be approximated as a first element. Why? Well, if the data is closed, it doesn't matter which of them to pick to be a base. It's going to be some delta offset from, from the rest, but who cares? So we tried first, we tried random element. It doesn't matter. It's, it's about the same. And it's, the result shows it's very close to the optimal element as well. So that gives us the first part of our uh, mechanism, base plus delta. The immediate part becomes of the second observation, usage of the second base as a zero base. Why that works? Because uh, it happens to be that uh, different types of values, in many cases, mix with narrow values, those that have a lot of uh, non-useful bits. So for those, you don't really care about w uh, w what is the base. You can just like take a zero, and that's good enough. So for narrow values, it doesn't matter. You can take just a base of zero. So two advantages of that mechanism, mechanism over two arbitrary bases is that now you have better compression ratio because you don't need to store second base because second base is implicit base of zero. And you also have simpler compression logic because it's easier now to just have one base and then the second is implicit zero. You don't need to make any complex operations there. You either add with one base or you just keep the same value because you don't need to make an addition with the second base. So it seems like a good idea, but how much I can lose or win if I switch to that mechanism? Again, I can lose because now more, uh, less things are compressible, but I win because I have less overhead. Is this clear? Yeah, question. Here's what if the first element is zero. Uh, very good question. I didn't talk about these uh, this details here. Clearly, you first uh, check 
for the base zero. So you compress everything that is compressible with the second base, and then you compress it with the, the first base. It, it's a good observation. The reason why I put it in that order is because that's how the names forms. But in terms of, uh, in terms of, of real hardware implementation, you first check the, everything that's compressed with the base zero, and then for the rest, you apply uh, the first base. So essentially, uh, for the first base, you can take any, uh, the first non-zero element, and that will going to be your base if you need it. So practically, when you do it, you do it very simply. You first compress everything that is compressible with base zero, and then you take the first non-compressible element and make it your base. Was it clear? Now, say you are going to be one mind that has a fixed position. Uh, which one? The offset part. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll talk about that. So it, it can be different in size. So that's a very good question. Again, I didn't jump into that here, but I can jump. I didn't jump into that uh, during my presentation, but I can explain what happens. So whenever you have a cache line, you don't really know what kind of data you have there. It can be integer float of different sizes. You don't really know. So in order to compress things, you apply, you, you, you do uh, a multiple parallel trials. So you try different base values and different deltas in size. So, so for instance, if you expect the integer data to be there, you try for base four, four bytes, and you try different deltas, one byte, two byte, potentially. If you take eight byte for floating point, for instance, you can try multiple deltas, one byte, two byte, four byte. So we'll try all of them in parallel. When I'll go to the implementation, I'll show what's going on there. But essentially, you can try different ones. The reason why we pick specific values is because Typically, those compressibility happens for with the general types, like in, int or float or double, and they are all known to be four byte or eight byte or two bytes or, or char like one byte. So you try all different combinations that might have sense. Yeah, question? This is for the base, uh, but what about the like, off, no, offset store for each location? So what you do, you do it in a vectoral fashion. You take the whole cache line. Uh, let's postpone this question. I have uh, a good explanation for it later. Yeah? Yeah, question? So, you, while compressing, you are just uh, looking at one cache line. But after compressing, you will have some stuff from the next cache line as well. So, so we're doing compression locally. So it's all happened per cache line. So whenever cache line arrives, say to last level cache, it's evicted from the L1 cache, that's when you compress it, or when it's coming from DRAM. So you only, uh, it's all happened locally. It's another advantage. All previous schemes that I showed, they were also local compressions. Global compression have a big fundamental issue because things will be dependent. If something changes, you need to go and validate all things around. So it's all local. You just do it for that particular ca uh, cache line. And then you will have some extra bits. So L1 cache line says, let's say 64 bytes, you get evicted cache line. So whenever you evict cache lines, then you decompress it, when you bring it into the L1. I'll get, I'll return to that and we'll talk about the house and the right now we're just talking about the idea in general. Yeah, questions? So, so just a quick question. So for example, when you're looking for the first space and you find like a, the largest number in the array, for example, you have an array of 10, 9, 8, 7. Six. Yes. Then if you pick 10 as base, all your deltas will be negative. So, yes. you solve so the mechanism, of course, deals with, uh, again, I didn't, uh, uh, in the paper we described this case, but here, essentially, it's very easy. If, if, if the delta, you, you need just an absolute value, really. Because if it's a negative, it's going to be, you, you need just invert it, and that's it. So that's what you do. Whenever you implement it in hardware, you just check whether it fits in the small range versus, uh, in the small range as a positive value or as an inverted value. Because if it's a negative, say minus one, it will just all one, 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 you just invert it and that's it. You just store a bit for inversion. Other questions? So it doesn't matter. Again, I didn't talk about this negative aspect, don't to make things complex, but okay. What we found is that both mechanisms are about the same in terms of compression ratio, but BDI, Base delta immediate compression is clearly simpler. So we pick it uh, as our final solution. And now we will show the real design based on base delta immediate compression. So there will be three big parts there. The first part, decompressor design. Then it's going to be compressor design. And then we uh, look into the whole cache organization. 
So first, de uh, decompressor design. So compressed cache line will be represented as base plus multiple deltas. For simplicity, I'm showing just one base, but with two bases, is implicit base zero, it's very simple as well. So what we do, we take that base and propagate it to all adders, and then we just do a simple parallel adders with all deltas, and we get the values. So you see, it can be done with a very simple vector addition. So that's your uncompressed cache line. You can do this as fast as one cycle, potentially. So now about compressor design. That's the question that you have. So there are multiple different compressor units that you have. And they are different. Well, there are two very simple zero and repeated values. But there are also other ones. So for instance, there is eight byte base zero, one byte delta. What it means? It means that we are guessing for that cache line that values are eight bytes and the good uh, a, go a good space for the offset is just one byte, but we also try two and four in parallel. So we'll try all of them in parallel, and all of them returns, uh, returns me some information. That information is whether cache line is compressible, compression flag, and uh, the compressed cache line, if it's compressible. Then I have selection logic that knows what are the sizes, because all the sizes are no, not, not now known. Because you know, if it was 64 byte cache line, I need, say, eight byte for base, and let's say all deltas are one byte, I exactly know the size. So I can, I can statically pick which compression scheme is better. So we just statically know all the compression sizes and just pick the best one. And then we get our compressed cache line. Okay, is that clear? So there are multiple different compressions because we, d we, we don't know what kind of data is there. So we need to try different combinations. This is like an educated guess. You can think about other sizes. But we found in experiments that is like enough in general, and it's reasonably complex. One single compressor unit for eight byte base and one byte delta looks like this. You have uncompressed cache line, say with four values here. They're all eight bytes in size. So your first decision, you make your base your first value and propagate there. And then you compute multiple deltas. You'll get four deltas in that case. Then for every delta, you check whether it's within one byte range. That's included the absolute value. So whether it's in one byte range or not. If every element is like this, then it can be compressed or represented that way. If not, then we can compress it. So that's simple. All of those units works like this. So the whole purpose of this slide showing that the logic there is not complex. It's, ta it's clearly taking more than one cycle, but it's uh, not on the critical path of execution. You do compression offline, either when the things are coming from DRAM or when they're coming from L1 cache. So that's not on the critical path. A little bit more uh, complicated thing is how to organize the cache. So the thing with the cache is, again, I will briefly introduce you like what you're doing with the regular cache, with a two-way, say, 32-byte cache line cache. You have text storage, you have data storage. Data storage is clearly bigger than the text storage. They are split it, and uh, there is a mapping. Every tag implicitly maps to the tag storage. In order to get a benefit of compression, I need more flexibility in my data storage. So the corresponding design, BDI design for that design, we need more ways, we need more tag storage. Why? At least twice. The reason for that, I need more pointers. If I make my cache line smaller, I still want to keep them in the smaller space, but I need more pointers to that data because the elements are now smaller. Is it clear to everyone? So that's unavoidable. All compression schemes somehow need to have more, more uh, space in text storage because you need to have more pointers to the data. In every tag, you also need to store now compression encoding bits because you need to know whether this cache line compressed or not and with which exactly flavor of your compression schemes it's compressed because it can be eight byte base, one byte delta, four byte base, two byte delta. So it's all this different combination. And the last but not the least, we ask for segment in the data. So we split our data storage. It's still the same in size, but now it's in the smaller segments. And now every tag stores a pointer to the beginning of a, a list of segments. Why is that helpful? Because now I can point one tag to say just one segment. Then this tag, won't, uh, this data won't occupy the whole cache line, it'll just occupy it only eight bytes. That gives me flexibility on how much data 
my cache line will occupy it in the tech storage. Got it? So that's additional complexity also in the design. We take one of the um, online available tool to relate the complexity and we find that the overhead of having something like this in the cache is 2.3%. So it is acceptable. So as I said, there were a bunch of prior work. There were several works based on zero compression and they have an issue. There were frequent value compression works, there were pattern uh, compression uh, designs. All have some, one of their one of the key parameters in the compression scheme was not there. Either compression ratio or the latency or the complexity or multiple at the same time. So all the have issues. So I want to show now that our design already showed that it's not complex and decompression latency is low, but it's interesting what is the performance. So I will do that after the break. I think it's time for a short break. So then I will show the performance numbers and we'll go to the second part of the lecture. Come to us, okay? Okay, evaluation. So there are methodology there. Uh, if you're interested in the details, you can look in the paper again. I don't think it's that critical to read all this. We try different cache sizes, different latency. All latencies are correctly collected by the proper tools. So the regular stuff you had to do for the paper. Nothing super excited. There will be some interesting results in the multi-core though. So there will be something special there. So first question is how much you get in terms of compression ratio. That's information here for different applications. Again, two megabyte L2 cache. The number of tags there is twice more. So that means that your compression ratio, it cannot be more than two. The reason you cannot address more than two cache lines. So no matter how good you can compress things, you still will never get compression higher than two. So you see for those applications that are super compressible, I cannot get beyond two. They potentially have a lot of empty space in the cache, but not enough tags to represent that, to use that empty space. So we did a sensitivity study later to show what happens if you have more tags than two, like four times more, 16 times more. But in general, that's too complex, so we just show here the numbers. And BDI issues the highest compression ratio. It is clearly better than zero compression, and it's even have a better compression ratio than two techniques that are more complex than BDI. That's the first metric. So it's interesting, but you want to see how much I will get in terms of performance. So here we did a study where I compare BDI with the baseline cache without compression, and we try different cache sizes in order to show that our design works relative on what kind of was the, the size of the cache. It doesn't matter. So as you can see here, there are performance improvement. It's different for different cache sizes. It's really not an, a, an attribute of our design. It's an attribute of where the working sets for this application starts to fit. So the highest improvement are for high 512. The reason for that, it's uh, for a lot of application and specs, it's a bottleneck there. And whenever you go to one megabyte out of a sudden or like with compression, you get significant boost of performance. And there are a little bit less there because a lot of application already saturated and they don't benefit a lot from more cache. So the primary reason why performance improves is because MPKI also decreases. MPKI decreases because now you create an illusion for an application having more space. So clearly now, you can have a better MPKI because more things stays in cache. And that helps applications that have some kind of spatial or temporal locality. For those applications that doesn't benefit though, you won't provide anything. So there are cases like GEMS from spec 2006 uh, that have super nice compressibility but doesn't benefit, it's really degraded a little bit. And the only reason is because it only cares about bandwidth, it doesn't care about capacity of last level cache. So the main result from here, you can also see that in many cases we will get performance of almost twice the cache. So that's very good. That's almost like our limit. But results there are not absolutely clean in the sense like when you go into a bigger cache, your access latency increases unavoidably. So whenever I'm getting my result here, I'm getting almost twice bigger cache but with lower latency because text storage is smaller, or data storage is smaller, uh, sorry. So it's interesting to understand what if I do an ideal experiment where I fix all the latencies for all different cache sizes and I see how much I provide in terms of capacity and the performance with my compression scheme. 
So there is this different, oh, it seems like animation is broken there. Yeah, somehow. Anyway, I try to very briefly introduce it. It's very hard maybe to read it. But th the idea here was, uh, yeah, it's broken, sorry. So the idea here is to show how close I can go to the optimal. So for, uh, for every BDI design, you can have a lower bound, which is uh, the cache of the same size but less ways. And there is an upper bound, twice bigger cache with twice more ways. If you make all latencies fixed, the best my design can do, it can make you an illusion of twice bigger cache. It cannot give you more than that. So the best you can go is trying to uh, go close to the optimal. So here though, uh, like for instance, here you can see we can go like only very close to the optimal, just 2.3%. For others, it's even closer. So the whole idea, this, when it's animated, it works, believe me, but now it's, it's really useful. Useless, sorry. So multi-core workloads. In multi-core workloads, there is some additional opportunity that doesn't exist in single core. So I present this result not just for the completeness what results for multi-cores, but there are some additional opportunities there. Why? The thing is, whenever you have different types of application, they might not, some of them might not benefit from compression, maybe not compressible. Some of them might not be sensitive to the cache size in general. They just don't care about, they don't have locality. So if you have application that have compressibility but don't have sensitivity, they won't benefit. If they have uh, sensitivity but don't have compressibility, they won't benefit. But if you mix applications like this, another one with, com uh, with high compressibility can create opportunities for another application that have sensitivity. So what happens when they're both united into one multi-program run, there will be a benefit, even though running as a single application, they won't benefit. So we created the classifications based on compressibility and sensitivity. So compressibility, we just define a little bit random, the rank after which application considered to be highly compressible. So 1.4 and low compressible if it's below. And we did the same for sensitivity. How we define sensitivity? I take say 512 kilobyte cache and two megabyte cache. And I look at the performance of the application. If performance significantly improves, that means it's sensitive to the cache size. If it doesn't care, so it means that it's low sensitive. Then I look to all different classes, like say low compressible, low sensitive, all different. This is like two properties and I, I, I try to classify all my applications based on these two properties. I found that there is no application of that type, low compressible, high sensitive. The intuition behind that, if, if you have large working space, you're probably sensitive for the cache size because you need to store that big data set. And because you have this big data storage, probably there are some, uh, there's something in common between this data, and that means it has some kind of compressibility there. So typically, if you're sensitive to the cache size, that means that you also have a big working set, and that also means that probably there will be some compressibility there. Not always, but of what we observe for our application. So that's some classification from the paper. So every, every application was classified. So what happens with the performance? So a couple of observations there. First, Again, we are the best, we beat all prior techniques. And as you can see, we beat even more than in single core case. Let's say for two megabyte cache before the performance improvement was 5%, here's on average 9.5. That's because of that effect that I explained you. Because now application that benefit, that do, doesn't benefit separately now starts to benefit when they're running all together. Another observation as you can see, if you split those pairs of applications for two cores into high sensitivity bin and low sensitivity bin, you will see that there are a lot of performance improvement there and very minor improvement there. That, 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 says, that just reflects that situation that uh, sensitivity matters really. If you have that sensitivity, you improve. If there is no sensitivity, no benefit. Yeah, question. You said that if you mix a high sensitivity application yeah. with a so low compressible, low compressible. Yeah. The benefit will always only be gained if they tend to share the same sets in the cache. Oh, no, that will happen. Why won't they share? Like, say you have two applications running. Yes, you can build a situation when they don't share sets, but why wouldn't they? Because remember, 
uh, mapping to the sets have nothing to do with the application, right? It just happens to be mapping. If you have two aggressive application, they, and they say streaming or striding, very fast they will occupy it al almost, they will have a cache line in every set that you have. So they will be mixing. So all sensitive applications will actually occupy the cache space. They will try to have as much as they can. So they will be sharing. It might happen not, but in general it happens. Any other questions? Or it's hard to read? So the key idea is that there are more benefits for multi-core than for single core because of that sharing of the resources. So now some, someone who doesn't benefit itself creates opportunities for another. And we have a more of that effect for four cores. So uh, there are some other results in the paper. We, see, we look at the effect on bandwidth because bandwidth also decreased. You now have less number of misses. And you can also compress the bandwidth bet between different levels in say L2 and L3 cache. So you can compress bandwidth between the different levels in cache. And there are conclusions. So conclusions are more or less obvious. New idea, have that nice properties and beats other guys that's already there. So it's, it's something that you should have at the end if you have a good paper anyway. Okay, I think we are done with this one. Do you have any questions? So, um, so you're compressing the uh, cache blocks. So if you fetch a cache line from L2, it will yeah. be compressed into multiple L1 cache No, into one. So if it's compressed, let's say you have a 64 byte cache line uncompressed, then it's compressed, let's say into 10 bytes. Okay. It's stored as 10 bytes. As a cache line? As a cache line. Yeah. Remember, due to segmenting, you can do that. It's stored as uh, in few segments. So in text storage, you store it as a smaller one. Right. I mean, like 64 byte cache line along the cross one to 10 byte compress, and, and it will be stored as a one cache line in L2 as 10 byte. So it will be stored as a point of the second Let me return. That's where I create animation. Yeah. There we go. So what happens is now every cache line is a tag mapped to a number of segments. So how many segments you need, that many segments you will be stored there. Let's take your example. Uh, you said it was like 10 bytes. Let's say uh, segments are 8 bytes. That means you will need two segments. To fit into, it will fit into 16 bytes, right? So it will occupy two segments like this to store that cache line. Okay, and then you, you just bring it to so what happens whenever there is a request, you will find the tag it maps to the segments, you will read this, and then you will give it to your decompressor. And it will decompress it into 64 bytes. So for L1, it's all transparent. Do you see how it works now? Yeah. What yeah. question of additional? So you will need an offset in the tag to indicate so th that's going to be now tag will become a point. It points uh, to the, the you need just to know the number of the first segment. That, that's what you know because you have encoding. Encoding tells you the size. You know the size, so you don't need to store the size. You only need to know beginning. So say like here is there are here you have eight segments. So you need three bits in order to know which segments you're starting. But like. Um, you're kind of underutilizing the L2, right? Because whenever you access L2, I will produce like 64 bytes. Like the granularity of the access will be, uh, be 64 bytes, right? Well, what, what, what would, uh, the thing is, uh, you know, you, you might say I underutilize the bandwidth, but still you will get requests and and backwards you will get the full 64 bytes. The conversion right. happens right there. On the L1 side it will be same, but on the L2 side you read 64 bytes and then just use yeah. the free, uh, or just use like 10 bytes out of it. Yeah. And it's not like underutilized. Those now free segments can be used by other cache lines. That's how we create space because some cache lines now need less segments. It means those segments can be used to keep more cache lines. There. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just talking about like you, you actually read the uh, like 64 bytes. Right? Yes, and read 64 bytes. So I was maybe kind of use the other portion because you already access all the data. Let's wait for the second paper. We'll t when we'll talk about DRAM compression, that where bandwidth matters, we'll talk about compressing data and utilizing bandwidth in a, in a better way. Uh, the, the bandwidth between L2 and L1 is not really a bottleneck. It's not a big deal. 
It can be energy-wise a bottleneck, but it's not really a big deal. Bandwidth from off-chip, so from DRAM to last level cache is a big bottleneck. You have performed bottom app comparisons? So there will be potentially increase in the tax uh, sorry, but first of all, I don't think it's done purely linearly. There are like efficient algorithms for do lookup, and most of the cache they also have parallel lookups right now. So you can do lookup in tax in parallel with the data lookup. So this, you can hide that latency. The late additional latency increase is going to be one two cycles at most. It's not big. We evaluated that in the paper as well. So there will be increase, but you can overlap as with other latencies. Including the decompression. Well, decompression you cannot overlap. Decompression will always be there. So because it's going to be, yeah, there's nothing you can do with decompression. Because you still, you get the data, you need to decompress it. There's nothing to overlap it because you'll access it. You can overlap the text storage search because you can do lookup in L1 first. So you can do something about it. But here you, you can't. So decompression you cannot overlap it with anything. Of that paper. So we now started to think about how to do it in DRAM. So I don't want to uh, go very deeply into all these details. I, I believe you read the technical report, right? So we were supposed to at least. So uh, I will go briefly trying to introduce what are the issues there. If you think I'm too slow, let me know. So I'll go faster. But high level goal here is can we get a benefit of compression in DRAM? And it might sound, oh, let's do the same as in cache. It doesn't work. I'll show you the challenges, why it doesn't. You can't reuse the ideas from the cache compression into DRAM compression. Yeah, I, I also introduced some prior works uh, that, that were there. OK? So summary is simple. We still want to reuse the same observation. There are redundancy in data. But now we want to apply it to a different uh, uh, level in the memory hierarchy to the memory. So we want to get more capacity. Why we talk about capacity? Well, all these data centers cares about capacity. They want to run on a single cluster as many applications as possible. Because if you don't fit into the memory, main memory, you go to the disk, it's like three orders of magnitude higher latencies, you're like screw up. So you really want to fit as much as you can on, the, uh, on this DIMM that you have. The problem here is very similar, but not exactly the same. The problem is, again, how to avoid latency increase, but it's not only due to decompression. Decompression is a less of an issue now. The reason, because the, uh, the latency to access DRAM is already like hundreds of cycles. So one cycle, five cycles, you don't care. But uh, people propose schemes that were very complex. So they propose something like uh, Lempel, uh, yeah, Lempel Z, for instance, in main memory. Uh, IBM pro make a proposal like that. So if you know how it works, it will take like hundreds of cycles to decompress a cache line in hardware. So it might be an issue even here, the decompression latency. But in general, that's not an issue. So our solution will improve capacity, but on top of that, it will also decrease bandwidth consumption by the application due to compression. And there will be clearly performance win if, if you uh, compress bandwidth. So three key challenges there that doesn't exist in the caches. The first one is address computation. So here I show, uh, maybe a little bit unconvenient way, that's the whole page, say four kilobyte, right? And it consists of multiple cache lines. In order to save space, I make it like one linear, but no, that's not a cache line. This small thing is a cache line now, 64 byte. Before, when your page is uncompressed, you always know what is the offset of the cache line where you know the number of a cache line because the offset is obvious, right? They're all equal. Now imagine you do some kind of compression there. All this thing might compress to different sizes. That's what typically compression schemes do for you. And the issue is now I don't know where this guy starts, how to read it. In order to know where it starts, I need to, co to get all these sizes, sum them up, and then I can only find that. So that's a problem. If you build a naive compression scheme with all these random sizes, you will have issues. Um, people before, when they proposed uh, uh, compression, and uh, compression in memory, that's the only one that was actually implemented in hardware. 
IBM in 2001 really implemented hardware with compressed memory. It was called IBM MXT design. They faced that issue. And uh, their solution was very trivial, and I'll show you why it's bad. So they just store all the sizes in memory separately. So whenever someone say, give me a second cache line, they say, they go to a different page, find that size there, and use it as an offset in that compressed page. So that was their solution. And you can immediately see why it's a problem. Great. Why is the problem? It's what? It adds it one, one more access to get. Yes, yeah, so you'll get two access you know. instead of one. So if, if bandwidth is your bottleneck, now you're screwed. Yes, you will get a benefit of capacity, but the latency increase is tremendous. So uh, MXT was trying, uh, like, it was so funny. They pick a design, make a wrong decision, then trying to fix it on the way. So they face that problem. Okay, the latency is increasing significant. What we can do about it? They say, oh, let's make a huge L3 cache, 32 megabytes, t more than 10 years ago, and operate it on big blocks. So this hides most of their memory accesses. So the latency becomes kind of invisible. But it's not scalable. You cannot keep doing that. You cannot, 10 years ago, imagine 32 megabyte L2 cache. That was, it was 32 megabyte L3 cache. So it was huge. So very, very soon they realized it's not a good design and then they just gave up. They said, well, it seems there's nothing you can do. You still need that offset somehow. It's not clear how to get it. So we gave up. Then there was an improvement afterwards. Another paper, uh, ISCA 2005 from Sweden. So the guys said, well, maybe we don't want to store it in the memory. Let's store it on chip. Chip is fast. It's not a big increase. And then, OK, uh, in order to avoid all this summing up, let's do it in parallel with L1 access. So it seems like a good idea. All latencies overlap. And it was 2005. Nobody cared about energy at that time. It was a huge waste of energy, because now, on every access to L1 hit, you need to sum up all these things. So you're doing a lot of redundant work, even if you don't have a memory access. So for every access, which, which is even LL1 hit, you compute its place in the memory in order to overlap this laten latency somehow. So it's a lot of redundant work done on chip. And also you need to store a huge storage that will store all these sizes. Imagine for every page, for every cache line, you need to store an offset. So it was a huge table on chip as well. So their design shows the good performance numbers, but it wasn't practical. So, yeah, questions? So the like to store the options in the same uh, page? Yes, okay. <laughs> But not exactly like this. So um, that's just part of an idea. You want to store metadata with the data on the same page, it's a good idea. But storing offset is still a bad idea, too many of them. So we, we were trying to avoid address calculation at all. So the idea was, let's make it such that we don't need to compute all this summing, all these sizes permanently. So first, the second problem that prior work didn't purely address, there is a problem of fragmentation and mapping now. All the pages have different sizes, so it's a nightmare for operating system now. You don't know what, what is this size, there is empty space there, empty space there, external fragmentation. It's unclear what to do, it just don't know the size of all these physical pages, right? So it's an issue for operating system that was ignored by prior work as well. And there is another problem is that it's less of an issue, but still an issue. Uh, uh, when, uh, all uh, modern caches are virtually indexed physically tagged. It means that you need physical address, part of the physical address to here in the cache. So even for the access that goes to the L2 cache, you need to know the physical address, right? Even though it doesn't go to the memory. So, so it means that if I introduce some complex address calculation, it will be added to this critical path as well. Yeah, question? Sure. Like, this wasn't uh, software in, in visible code. You still have to software. It was exposed to software. Uh, in MXT, it was not exposed to software. It was fully done in hardware. It was hidden. In ISCA 2005 paper, it was exposed to software. The way it was exposed to software, you're asking, for pages of different sizes. So, but not random, say like four kilobyte, two kilobyte, one kilobyte, some known good granularities. So that's what they approach. Okay, questions? 
So that's that. And I described those papers. And that's the issues they had. And again, we will try to solve the issue. Why, is, why our idea is linearly compressed pages? Well, we pick a compression scheme and apply for every cache line, we apply a compression schemes that have a statically known compressed size. So there are compression schemes that have that property for uh, like BDI, for instance, the one that I introduced today. And there are others that you can easily fix. So for every compression scheme, you can say, you either fit in, say, four times the space, or you doesn't fit after compression. If it fits, then good. If it doesn't fit, well, then we store it in exception storage. That's the idea, essentially. We take compression scheme and fix compression scheme per page. But different pages can have different compression schemes. So then, for every cache line, I know where it's supposed to map if it's compressed. And if it's not, I store this data in the metadata, I mean, whether it's compressed or not, and then I store additional line in exception storage. What, what is good in the design? First of all, metadata, as you notice, is stored together with the data. So you can do a different overlapping, you can do different types of pipelining of memory accesses if you need to access. But the thing, you still need to access. You first need to access metadata and then the data. So it's still bad in that sense. You can overlap the latency, but still bad. So in order to hide that latency, we will have some optimizations later on. But that's simply the idea. So you fix compression per the whole page, then every linearly compresses, because if this is four to one, yeah, that was four kilobyte, that becomes statically known one kilobyte. And as you can see, because all of sets are now easily computed, you know this, where this one will go, where this one will go, they're all like fixed sizes. There's no complex address computation needed. So that's the primary benefit, that's simplicity in organization. Yes, you will lose in compressibility, but yep. But still for, for the L2 tag, you still need to access the uh, physical memory, right? To yeah, the, 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 the point of uh, this thing here, yes, you still need, the point of this one is not saying that you don't need it. The thing is, before, computing physical address takes a lot of additions. Because now, your, your, your cache line is somewhere in a random place in a random page. So even if you don't really even need to go to the DRAM, you still need to do this computation because it's an L2. You see the, the problem? Even I don't need this physical address, but because my cache is physically tagged, I need to compute this thing. Whatever, whatever complexity you will add, will add it to that latency. But, but to figure out the actual physical address, you need to go to DRAM and then see the metadata and then figure out the location of the actual. Uh, in our design? Or yeah. in, in other designs? In, in, the, uh, yeah, this in this design? So in this design, you, uh, what you do in this design, you start to read metadata and data speculatively at the same time. Because if I know that it's my second cache line, I immediately know where it's located there. Right? You know the offset. Because your page has a known compression, so you know the ratio, so you know where it's going to be. Well, and the compression is encoded in the metadata? Yes. Uh, no, not in metadata. And uh, the compression will be encoded in the TLB bits. Oh, okay. So you know it ahead of time before okay. the access. Good question. Yeah? So what, what is stored in metadata? Uh, I'll talk about this. Essentially, it's just two bits. Here I'm just saying it's it just, for every cache line is two bit, but it's compressible or not compressible, just one bit. So the whole metadata is just 64 bytes. So what if a cache line is not compressible? It's, it's then stored here in exception storage. So fully uncompressed one. So doesn't it limit the... Uh, so can you have a case where you have like every cache line? Yes, is not, not every page is compressible. So some pages are compressible, some are not compressible, clearly. Uh, I'll talk about that. That's a good question, I'll talk about it. Yeah, questions? Uh, because that's a key idea. That's all good questions, so we'll solve them. Clearly not everything is compressible, there's no expectation of this. There can be random data. So when compression happens, compression happens when you bring data from the disk. So whenever you bring the disk again, you try multiple different compression schemes. And for those that you see the win, for after you compute that, you see that the final size is better than that size, then you store them in compressed form. If it's not, then you don't store it. And you don't do it at random granularity in order to make in order to avoid the pain for us. So you do it, say, like one kilobyte, two kilobyte, you align it. 
to some good sizes in the OS. So in the OS, you need to make a change. You need to have a pool, not of only four kilobyte pages, let's say one kilobyte pages, two kilobyte pages. But that's a simple change in OS. You have concerns about it? That was done already, I mean, by others, for, for different reasons. Okay. Good puzzle. Why does the effective size of your page change? Like at the little point of compression, is that it? The, uh, the size changed because you have writes at the cache line during the learning time. No, 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 I mean like, okay, never mind, I'll look. Yeah. So, uh, applying different compression schemes, you can have different compre uh, compressed size, so you pick the best. Yeah. But then it can can be changed. But it can be changed later on because there are rights right. to the Okay. So so how much? So in this lower compressed data block, how much data? Space. How much data is being represented by that block? So that it's very easy to compute. Depend let's say you have this four by one. So that that occupies one kilobyte. That occupies sixty four byte. Then the rest are. No, no, but how much data does that represent? How much, how much data? In compressed form. Uh, it depends on which initial pool you put it. Let's say we uh, compress it with that ratio and we put it as a two kilobyte, right? Let's make it some example. Let's say this was like one kilobyte something and we put it in two kilobyte pools. It means that you can store, uh, you can just compute. You take two kilobytes, so minus one, minus 64 bytes. So it's one kilobyte minus 64 bytes. So uh, four kilobytes is like 64 k inch lines. That it's really like you can store like 30, uh, it's half. It's, it's like 15 additional for that particular case. So there are some limit in how many of those you can store. And if you keep writing something bad, then you will be over the size. Then there will be a special handling by OS of that event. So for every particular one, you can have, that's a dynamic part. You can change it. And you have an index that's stored in an usable part. Any questions here? Yeah. So uh, if, if the uh, cache line is in the exception part, yes. does it consider to be TLD miss to figure out the physical address? No, it's, it's not a TLD miss. It, it will just take more, uh, it will be increasing latency for that access. So what happened first, you will access metadata, right? Uh, and in parallel, speculatively, you will access the corresponding block here. Then when metadata arrives, you will find it's not compressed. You will do the second request here. But you already know where to go because this one, if the block is not compressible, you store there the index because it's, you store the index here. I'm hiding all these details, but it's nice that you ask me. Yeah. Page locking is done in hardware, in there, so wouldn't you have to change that? What do you mean by page locking? Like uh, getting physical address from the address if it is not in my DLB. Uh, so you have to access multiple page lock. Well, you need to do multiple DRAM accesses, yes. It will be increasing latency, yes, but it's uncommon. I will show that it's uncommon. For the pages that are well compressed, the number of extensions is small, so the cases when you need to access that is small. No, what I'm talking about is the page level mock. Okay. Which usually happens if there is no TLG entry. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are some fit, uh, fixed format of page directories and page tables. So wouldn't you have to append your hardware, your page mock hardware to mock hardware? The on, uh, as far as I understand, at least the organization of TLB, you only need a couple of bits to represent the offsets. Uh, in terms of big, uh, big page. So you have like a four kilobyte page. Now I'm allowing to have pages of smaller sizes, like one kilobyte. I just need a few bits to store where at the beginning of the page is. Yeah, you need like three bits in TLB to store that information in the address. So that's storing the address. That's on the upcoming slides that you're asking ahead of time. So you need only the offset of a page, of uh, a smaller page instead of, in, uh, inside of a bigger page. So if you think about having like a big, a big four kilobyte page before, now you can have like multiple pages inside. So I only need 
this bit or this bit. So I need only the starting, right? So if it, this is a 4 kilobyte page, I can have, say, like 1 kilobyte, 1 kilobyte, 1 kilobyte, 1 kilobyte page there. So in order to know which, where it starts here for the address calculation, I only need to have two bits, whether it's this one, this one, this one, and this one, or this one. That's it. And then you know how much to add in address calculation because it's like add two kilobytes or, or three kilobytes to the offset. So offset calculation is still simple because everything is linear. Any other questions? Oh, you don't have questions. How is it possible? Okay. I think we already talked about almost everything in that slide because we've asked questions. Essentially, I, I'm talking here about what kind of changes are needed to the page table entry, uh, what is needed in terms of operate, uh, operating system changes, uh, what is needed to the cache tagging logic, what are those additional bits you need to, like, to add to the cache line, and there are page overflows. Those are special events when your exception storage you keep growing, 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 and you don't fit into the dedicated size anymore and you need a special event to handle that in OS, and that's very time consuming. So in paper, again, we evaluate how often that happens and what we need to do in that case. The good thing about it, typically, if something is compressible, it stays re reasonably compressible for a while. So you see like oscillations. So exception storage, let's say, like jumps from four, five, six, four, five, six, like there are some oscillations that it typically doesn't jump. But you can easily imagine the case when you have zeros and someone writes random data into that. So there can be sparks of activity like this. But in general, on average, it's small. We have some optimizations. One optimization is metadata cache. So as you notice, I always need to access metadata first. So in order to avoid that additional access, we have metadata cache, small cache, that stores metadata for commonly accessed pages, such that you don't need to access metadata. You always know it. Well, unless when it's a hit, you know. And the hit rate for us. Like it's quite good, it's like 95% for a very small metadata cache. The hit rate is very similar to the TLB table, it's the same idea. Let's keep hot pages close, the, the information about hot pages. There are a couple of additional optimization we had to store information about zero pages and zero cache lines. Because those you don't even need to read. If you know that the page is zero and you have that bit in TLB, don't even bother reading it, it's like you know it's zeros. So, there is a huge win for those cases, potentially. Again, it's unsimulated. You, you can find that in the, uh, the tech report already. So what is here? We did, uh, LCP is not a compression scheme by itself. It's a design that can incorporate different compression schemes. So what we did, we tried different techniques, compression techniques, BDI, our technique, and FPC, one of the best prior techniques, and showed the numbers there. So here, this is something like the best I can possibly do statically, this lamp of Z. That's IBM design, you see, it's, they have a very good compression ratio. But who cares about this good compression ratio if, if, if your latency increases like three times more? So nobody cares. And that are different flavors of our, our design. And we look to the bandwidth consumption decrease. So what happened is that our design allows also to get ben uh, benefit in bandwidth. I think we have a group that is working on exploiting this as well. Uh, idea is very simple. Whenever I'm reading a cache line, uh, before I had to read 64 bytes. Now, if you think about how data is represented linearly, I have four JSON cache lines represented potentially as one. So in one read, I can get four cache lines, and three of them are for free. So you can get a benefit of bandwidth. And then there are all these nice questions you can ask whether I want to put them in the last level cache, whether they're useful or not useful. If I add them, it can be a benefit, but it can be pollution as well. All these are open questions. In the paper, we always add them. We, we, pick like. we also try to uh, make some nice decision there, but it, it shows that it doesn't matter for our workloads. Okay, so that's the potential decreasing bandwidth. You see, we can decrease bandwidth almost half. With that. So it's all, not only more capacity, it's also less bandwidth. Less bandwidth means also less energy spent because you don't need to wire the data there. So there are all these benefits coming here. Performance, uh, bandwidth, and energy. And that's performance improvement on, for different designs. As you can see now, uh, the best designs have like 20% improvement. Why? 
So here we show that the best designs are when the cache is compressed and uh, the DRAM is compressed. Why? The cache compression helps for the cases when you have a lot of locality. When you have a lot of locality, bigger cache helps. DRAM compression helps if you have bandwidth your bottleneck. So a lot of applications are typically either computationally bounded or cache size bounded or bandwidth bounded, one, one of three. If it's computationally bounded, there's not much we can do in memory hierarchy. But for all two problems, we can help here. So what happens, performance is significantly better when you do compressions in two levels. Because you, can, you, you, have, you, you help a lot of applications that belongs to the later two classes. Not the first class, but the two classes. First paper helps only application that benefits from more cache capacity. This one helps uh, two types of applications. And for instance, for stacks, out of 30, it's probably like 25 applications will benefit. Any question? Yeah, questions? Where does decompression happen after you receive the so uh, there are, you have multiple options there. You, based on LCP framework, you can build systems where only DRAM is compressed, where, say, DRAM is compressed and last level cache is compressed. So if only DRAM is compressed, then decompression happens when you access the data from DRAM. So whenever the request misses last level cache and goes to DRAM, you read the DRAM, there is a compressed data there, you decompress it when it arrives to last level cache. Memory c controller will be responsible for this. If you allow last level cache to be compressed, then decompression will happen only at L1. So you have flexibility there. But uh, having a decompression at memory, it wouldn't help bandwidth because you have to return. So you will do decompressions uh, after the data arrived to the memory controller, which is allocated on chip. So let us say that is compressed mm -hmm. and the first time it's brought from disk to memory. That's correct. So what you do uh, when the initial data is coming from disk, you try again multiple different compression schemes for that page and pick the best and just keep it in that format. Show me. Uh, what? This, uh, there are already pro like people compress disk for a very long period of time because the latency is very high. You can use any compression scheme you want. So disk already compressed. The problem was you cannot reuse their compression schemes in hardware because it's too complicated. You need something reasonable in hardware. Yes, you can. I, I think they already do something like this. They, they already use compression for 20 years. Probably. The problem was on moving this idea to caches is how to make it keep it simple. So it didn't move until people make this first observation about frequent value in 2000, then it starts to move a little bit. There are like simpler methods of compressing rather than doing this. Because before people always look into all this Huffman encoding, Lambda's interest. It was too complex, it doesn't work. Okay. What role does operating system play in this? So the operating system is responsible for locating pages of different sizes. So the change in operating system is now you need to have a pool, not of only four kilobytes. So you know how operating system uh, plays with the memory, right? They have different, uh, they have multiple pages stored in a pool. Now you need to have multiple pools of different sizes. That allows you to avoid uh, external fragmentation. There are opportunities for us to play a more interesting role. They might try to map something more aggressive, let's say, map this to with that compression scheme or something like this, but that's hard to evaluate. It's hard to make those decisions. Anyway, then we're done. Okay. Thanks everyone. So ask questions if you still have some.